Sorry to bother you again. I must be slow. I got a quarter after. Oh, well, Lieutenant, 4.15, right on the nose. Uh, you got a cigarette? I'm all out. Oh, here. Right there. Help yourself. Lieutenant, you want something to read? I got a nice Esquire right in the bottom drawer there. You sure? You looking for Camp GG, Lieutenant? Huh? Looking for Camp GG? Why, is it on here? Oh, sure. We got all the red prison camps marked with pins. Now, let's see. Uh, GG. GG, GG. Here we are. 41 degrees. That ought to put it somewhere around. Let's see. 40. Here we are. Sanan. No, no. GG. There you are. GG. Yeah. Well, I guess you don't need a map to remember that dump, huh? Guess not. Colonel will be along in a couple of minutes, Lieutenant. What you said 20 minutes ago. Oh, Lieutenant, this is just a routine investigation. There's nothing to be nervous about. I'm not nervous. I, I just want to know the story on all this business. I, I got a leave coming up. Are we all going to have to hang around here and testify at this court martial or what? Well, sir, there might not even be a court martial. What does that mean? Well, you see, sir, the Colonel is the investigating officer. Now, he just gets the facts together and makes a recommendation to the General. Now, it's up to the general to decide whether there's going to be a court-martial or not. Yeah, but in a case like Cargo's, there can't be any doubt, can there? Well, I wouldn't think so. You threw my cigarettes. Thank you. I just wish they'd get on with it. Uh, Lieutenant, don't worry. Colonel levels would we'll give you every break he can, believe me. Well, you mustn't get the wrong idea about him just because he's a staff officer. He wasn't always in the Chairborne Infantry. You know, we were in the boats together, him and me. The college man. Looks, brains, personality, everything. Just got one blind spot. Can't go for sergeants. Huh? Right. Oh, Colonel Edwards, it's a good thing you're back. Yeah, I'm sorry I kept Miller waiting. Well, it's not that, sir. The general called. Yes? You, uh, sat for me, sir? Oh, yes, Bill. Come in. Come in. I've been waiting for you. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I had to interview some people on the cargo case. Off the post? Yes, sir. That was the best way to see them, civilians. Oh, Bill, you've been taking a lot more time than usual on this case. Been on it for several months. Yes, I know. We've got a lot of cases ahead of us. They're after me to get things moving. I understand, sir. Can't hold them up much longer. It's not fair to the people involved. That's why I was hoping you'd wind this one up as soon as possible. Well, I'll do my best, sir. I've got my last witness waiting for me now. The last one? Yes, sir. Good. That's what I want to hear. All right. Oh, that's some gadget you got there, Lieutenant. See, May 15th, 1954. Oh, full moon. How do you tell time with these things? I mean, they must have set you back plenty. Oh, one in a crap. Baker? Yeah, take this over to CIC, will you? Yes, sir. Sit down, Lieutenant. Sorry to keep you waiting. I didn't realize I'd be gone so long. It's all right, sir. This won't take too much longer. Just a few routine questions. Let's see, where were we yesterday? Question, had you known Major Cargo before you were prisoners together in Camp Gigi? Answer, no, sir, none of us did. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, how long were you at this camp before Cargo was put into your shack? About four months, sir. Uh-huh. And that means you all lived together for nine months before it happened. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, tell me, Lieutenant, how did it happen? Well, sir, it happened very suddenly. It, it took us all by surprise. Yes, but just how? Sir, you must... Know that? You must have it in there. I've got the testimony of 14 different witnesses in here, Lieutenant, but I still need your own version of it. <laughs> yes, sir. Then let's hear it just the way you yes, remember sir. it. Yes, eh? sir. Just the way I remember it. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember it was real cold that day. It's cold. 
Man, you don't know what cold is till you've been cold in North Korea. Like every day, they got us up at dawn, made us get out to the compound for one of those lectures. Just like any other day. Except for one thing. Colonel Kim was late. <laughs> comes old Baldy. Yeah, the Honorable Colonel Kemp. Wonder what he's done to Cargo this time. What he always does. He's got him in the hole. Yeah, but I'll bet you first he tied old Kim up in knots again. Don't worry about Cargo. If you want to worry about somebody, you worry about Kim. Sit down, gentlemen. Today we will review the lecture of yesterday. The history of all previous societies has been the history of class struggle. Struggles between the oppressors and the oppressed. <coughs> the... <coughs> <laughs> now, repeat after me. Communism is peace. Ready? <laughs> Communism <laughs> is... <laughs> peace. <laughs> well, comrades, since you don't choose to listen to me, perhaps... Boyo, Tyra, Bunny! No! No! Police! Comrade Cargo, class is yours. I know this will come as a surprise to you, but... but I hope you'll cooperate with me. For our first session, we'll approach the subject from a historical point of view. The, the, as Colonel Kim has said, the history of all previous existing societies has been the history of the class struggle, the, the bourgeoisie which owns and controls the means and instruments of production. Has it, exploited the wor working class, which depends upon it, but thereby the bourgeoisie has also forged the weapons of its own destruction. It, uh, it. You're doing very well, Major. He doesn't need me here. Continue. Oh yes, a word of warning. Any harm to this comrade will bring reprisals on everyone. Thereby, the bourgeoisie has also forged the weapons of its own destruction. It has created the men who are to wield okay, those weapons. Okay, he's gone. It has created the men who are to wield those weapons. These are the proletarians, the standard bearers of the new civilization. He's gone. The new utopia. It is a cause to which all men of goodwill everywhere can dedicate their, their energies, their talents, and their lives. In communism, there's only one class, and it works for peace. Communism is peace. Wait. Wait. Wait, listen, listen to me. Oh, don't be such heroes. This man means business now. He's got to show results. Miller. You understand? Miller! You do 
understand? I don't understand. Not, not even to this day, sir, I just don't understand. And that uh, was the first indication that Cargill had gone over, huh? Yes, sir, that's the first indication we had. Now, after that one time, did he continue these activities? Yes, sir, right up to the time we left GG to be exchanged. I see. Well, Miller, uh, what, what, what else did he do that you'd consider collaboration? Well, sir, we heard he made radio broadcasts for them saying the United States had used germ warfare. Mm -hmm. Of course, we only heard about that. I know he signed one of those germ warfare confessions because I saw one of them. Like this? Yes, sir, that's it. Did he also make newsreels for the enemy? Newsreels? Yeah. No, sir. No, he couldn't have. Mm -hmm. Miller, can you think of any reason why he went over? Well, sir, I've been thinking. Is, is it possible maybe he was a plant? You know, he was one of them all the time. Well, you testified yesterday that nobody ever suspected him. Now, do you want to change your testimony? No, sir. I, now that I think about it, I don't know. Guess he could have been, could he? Well, I mean, I no more expected Harry to go over than I would my own brother. Were, uh, were you and Cargill close friends? Cargill and me? Yeah. No, sir. Well, the way you talked, I thought you might be close buddies. No, sir, you? we weren't any more friends than anybody else. Do you have any special friend in the compound? No, sir. Why? Well, in the 48 hours before Cargill broke, two men died. Uh, Captain Connors and, uh, L Lieutenant... Harvey, sir? Yeah, that's right, Lieutenant Harvey. Incidentally, how did Harvey die? Well, I thought you knew that, sir. No. Lieutenant Harvey died following an acute case of dysentery. And Captain Connors? Same thing, sir. Uh, that dysentery must have been pretty rough, hmm? Yes, sir. It was a real killer. Fact, sir, eight of the nine men that died in our shack died of dysentery. You see, sir, in cases of bacillary dysentery, the incidence of death is pretty high, especially when there's no medicine. See, what happens is dehydration sets in, and the, the sick man suffers from a general wasting away, and he just dies. Well, I guess all of you got to be amateur medics, didn't you? <laughs> yes, sir, we had to be. Well, that's a pretty shocking thing to see your friends die that way. Well, that's exactly what I meant, Lieutenant. Seeing something like this could shock a man enough to crack him, especially if the victim were a close friend of his. Well, I see what you mean, sir, but I just told you Cargill didn't have any close friends. Why not? Well, sir, Was I... he cold, unfriendly? No, sir, he was friendly enough. We used to kid him all the time. We called him professor. Not that he really was a professor, but he, he taught in some college. He was an instructor. Instructor, that's right. That's right. And when we called him... Professor, we weren't riding him or anything like that, because, you see, all the men liked him, respected him, right from the time he, he got to Gigi. In fact, sir, that's one of the most vivid memories I have of the entire war. What was that? It's the first time that Cargo got to our shack. You see, one of the men had died during the night, and we got permission to bury him, and we stood around in the rain, and somebody read from a Bible. And when we got ready to cover up the body, Cargo steps to the edge of the grave and he says, My brother dies that I may live. May I be worthy of his sacrifice. From that time on, whenever he talked, we, we listened. You see, we trusted him, we respected him, you know? My brother dies that I may live. <laughs> that doesn't sound like their philosophy to me, Lieutenant. Well, that's nine months before he went over here. He had a lot of time to think. Sir, don't you know those guys like him, these guys that think too much? You know, they can kind of get taken in by that kind of stuff. Then you think Cargill was taken in? Sir? Well, some of these men went over for personal gain or physical comfort, but you don't think it was that way in his case? Well, no, sir, there, there's no indication of that. Then you think he really embraced their philosophy? Well, sir, I don't know. There's only one person can tell you that. As you were. Bill, Sergeant Fleischecker told me there was a boy here from Camp Jeezy. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Miller, this is General Connors. Lieutenant, 
You must have known my son, Captain Connors. Joe Connors. Oh, yes, sir. I know I'm interrupting, but I had to find out. Oh, that's quite all right, sir. Give me a minute, will you, Bill? Yes, yeah, sure. Evans. Well. Mint? Thank you, sir. Did you know my son before Gigi? Oh, yes, sir. We were in the same outfit, you know. A fine outfit, Lieutenant. You men made quite a record for yourselves. Thank you, sir. It wouldn't have been the same without Joe. Well, in fact, sir, when Joe died, every man at the camp felt as, as though he lost a brother. You must have known him well. Well, sir, when you lived together in a small shack that long, yes, sir, I, I knew him very well, sir. Lieutenant, how about joining me for a drink at the club? Well, sir. I want to talk to you about Joe. Bill? Yes, sir. I asked for a minute, now I need an hour. Is that all right with you? Well, I was. Well, yes, yes, of course, sir. We'll go on with this in the morning, boy. Come on, son. How did uh, Flyshacker know that Miller was in here? Oh, you know Flyshacker, sir. He's a one-man radar system. Yeah. Sir, these are finished. Oh, thanks. Okay, Baker, what's up? Why, nothing, sir. Not, nothing at all. Now, don't kid me. With you, it's never nothing. Oh, that's a very unfriendly remark, sir. It indicates a complete lack of trust and confidence. That... Oh, I'm terribly sorry I hurt your feelings, Baker. Now, what do you want? May I take that as permission to discuss this matter further? All I have to do is breathe, and you take it as permission. All I'm trying to do is be cooperative, sir. I'm just trying to suggest, sir, that this case is so open and shut, we don't even need a court-martial. Oh, I see. Look, sir, all we have to do is take a card, punch holes in it, one for each wrong thing this Major Cargill did, send it through an IBM machine and come up with the right answer. That's the kind of case this is. So? So the sooner it's over, the better. Why? Sir? Why? You've got to have a reason. Well, if the Colonel will forgive me for saying so, you're wrong. Look, sir, I'm no intellectual. I don't need a reason. But as long as the Colonel's open up the subject for further discussion, I would like to say that I don't like the whole idea of the Colonel handling this case. This is a hot potato, sir. Baker, what? is there anything else on your mind? Yes, sir, as Just long as you're asking yes me. Yes or no, anything else on your mind? Yes, sir. Then shut right. up. <laughs> something for me. Go out the machine, get us some coffee. Coffee, Evans? Yes, sir. Never mind, it's on me. Yeah, the Colonel's throwing a farewell party. What's the matter with him today? Maybe it isn't Baker. What? Well, sir, perhaps you're a bit touchy today? Draw it as possible. Oh, is it? Well, sir, if you'd really like my opinion, yes. Evans, I'm tired of being analyzed today. I'm tired of being told... I'm tired of being told how to do my job. And, and, and if I'm touchy, and why? <clears throat> Sir, what are extenuating circumstances? Oh, I don't mean that. I mean... Couldn't something be extenuating circumstances to one person, not to another, sir? That's always a matter of opinion, Baker. Well, let's say that there's a general who had a son who died in a prison camp, just for the sake of argument. Let's say there's a major who was at the same camp who uh, went over to the enemy to save his own neck and comes out of the whole deal alive. Baker, 
There is a prescribed routine in all cases involving possible court-martial, right? Mm. And if it takes a certain amount of time, we'll take that time, right? Right. But when it's done, it'll have been done with full regard for his rights under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, you understand? Mm Mm-hmm. That's very good, sir, as far as the book is concerned. Where the general is concerned... The general happens to be a friend of mine. Oh, but, sir, I happen to be a friend of Sergeant Fleischak, who works in the general's office. It is Sergeant Fleischak's opinion that anybody... not knock it off, will you? Okay. No more advice for you, though. Good. Sir. Major Cargo is at the reception desk. Okay. Have him come up. Now, Major. This way, Major. Major Cargill, sir. Come in, Major. Sit down. Word certainly gets around, doesn't it? Well, I'm sure you're aware of the seriousness of the charges against you, aren't you, Major? Now, first, uh, let me review your rights under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. You don't have to answer any... I don't any have to incrimin- answer any incriminating questions. I don't have to make any statements. I have the right to be represented by counsel. Article 31 of the code. I'm familiar with it. I'm willing to answer all questions, and I don't want to be around when you question witnesses. Okay. Let's get on with it. Name, rank, serial number. Harry Cargill, Major Artillery, 0943205. You the same Major Harry Cargill who was imprisoned in Camp GG in yes, Korea? Yes, sir. You were captured during the breakthrough along the Yalu River in North Korea? Yes, sir. You were hospitalized for two months and you were transferred to this Camp GG. Oh, that's right. Well, Major, certain charges have been made against you. I'll recite them, then you'll have the opportunity of making a statement. Now, first, it's alleged that during... First, it's alleged that during November 1951, you made a radio broadcast for the enemy in which you admitted taking part in germ warfare. Well? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Would, uh, Would you repeat that, please? It's alleged that during November 1951, you made a radio broadcast for the enemy in which you falsely admitted taking part in germ warfare. Is that true? Yes. It's further charged that you gave indoctrination lectures favorable to the enemy to your fellow prisoners. Is that true? Yes, sir. I have a statement here confessing to germ warfare, which supposedly carries your signature. It's my signature. Well, look at it first, Major. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's my signature. Did you ever make propaganda newsreels for the enemy? Yes, yes, I did. Look, Major, I've already advised you of your rights to counsel, so I suggest you get a lawyer before we proceed any further. I don't want a lawyer. I just want to get this over with as quickly as possible. Don't you realize you're being accused of treason? Yes, I realize that. And you still want to confess without consulting a lawyer? Well, why not? I'm guilty. Of everything? Yes, of everything. Including making newsreels for the enemy. Major, why are you trying to hang yourself? Why do you confess to something that you didn't do? 
Because, as I told you before, I want to get this over with as quickly as possible. Well, now, will that be all? No, not quite. The Army not only wants to know if you did these things, but also why, so sit down. Well, Major? Well, what? Why'd you make those broadcasts, give those lectures? Because I had no choice. Does that mean you were tortured? Yes. How? Just tortured. Well, they must have done certain things to you. What? Well, they put me in the hole. What was it like? Just a hole scooped out of the ground, covered over with boards like solitary confinement. How many times they put you in the hole? I don't know. Nine, ten times, maybe. I don't remember exactly. And that's what made you break? Yes. The day you broke... They put you in the hole that day? Yeah. The day before? Yes, the day before that? Yes, the day before that? Yes. That's a lie, Major, and you know it. I've got the testimony of 14 witnesses here who deny you were in the hole on any one of those days. Now, what are you trying to do? Look, what do all these details matter? I told you I'm guilty. That's the important thing, isn't it? You want to make any statement at all in your own defense? I do not. Well, in that case, there's uh, no point in prolonging this, is there? None whatsoever. Oh, well, just one more thing, Major. Today on our English language news broadcast, we have an interview with an officer of the United States Army. The truth he speaks will be of interest to all Asiatic peoples. I will now ask questions. Who are you? I'm Major Harry Cargill. What's the point of this? You, I want you to you identify these respect. voices for so me. So that those who listen will know that this is the truth. Tell us your serial number. My serial number That's my voice, OK? Nine, four, three, two, three. Who's the interrogator? Now, Major, before you were captured... Colonel Kim, Commandant of Camp GG. Now, if that's all, I... That's not all. I thought you'd like to listen to the entire transcript, Major. So you were with a bombing squadron. What was purpose of squadron? To drop bombs. Look, uh, couldn't we do this some other time? We've got to do it now. What kind of bombs? Bacteriological. You mean germs? Deadly germs? Yes, germs, deadly germs. American airplanes have dropped deadly germs on innocent, helpless Turn Asiatic peoples of Korea. United Please. States has engaged in germ war against the people of Asia. That is so? Please turn it off! What is so, Major? The United Turn States it off! Asia. back tomorrow. Your testimony is interesting, but incomplete. You find that simply saying you're guilty is not enough. You don't understand. I am guilty. Cargo's testimony as soon as possible, sir. Yeah, I do. Come on, let's get out of here. Baker has uh, been putting the pressure on you, too? What do you mean? About what a special case this is. I don't know, sir. No lectures about what Baker thinks, uh, Fleischacker thinks, the general thinks? <laughs> no, sir, why? Nothing. But just understand one thing, Evans. 
This is no different than any other case in this office. Yes, sir. What's the matter? I, I'm sorry, but I, I can't go with you. I've got to go back. Is that overtime? Yeah. Good night, Evans. Did you see this? What's the matter? You been here all night or what? Well, what's the matter? What happened? What's the matter? What's the matter? Take a look at that. What about it? What about it? That is an order from the general. Well, one thing for certain, it's not an order from any sergeant, sergeant. Oh, come on. No jokes. Look at that signature, will you? Signed Joseph Connors, Lieutenant General Commanding. Now, just any order would be signed by his adjutant, but when the general signs the order himself, that is significant. That's really significant. In view of the backlog of work which has been observed in some divisions of this headquarters, it is directed that all accumulated work be completed with efficiency and dispatch. With efficiency and dispatch. Now, I'm telling you, the Colonel is in trouble. You think this is really directed at the Colonel? Well, now, the only way the old man could make it any plainer would be to put up a neon sign saying, don't waste time on the Cargill case. Ah, Sergeant, I think you're jumping to conclusions. Am I? Hey, wait a minute. You can't do that. I know. That's an official document. I'll bring it back. I'm just going to check it with Fleischacker. Check then. what with Fleischacker? Good morning, sir. Good morning. Just want to make sure it didn't get mislaid, so that's all. I'll bet. Maybe now you believe me when I tell you that the general Baker, is still working. Baker, uh, will you get me some coffee? Sir, what about just, the memo? Just coffee, Baker. One or two donuts. Just coffee, Baker. Coffee. Just coffee, Baker. Coffee, Baker. Baker says the general really meant that memo for you. Baker says. Baker and Confucius seem to enjoy the same standing around here. We will proceed on the assumption that this memo is exactly what it appears to be, a general order to spruce up the entire post. Yes, sir, we will proceed on the assumption. Well, if the general had wanted to say something, I, I, I am sure he'd have come right out and said it. Yes, sir. Excuse me. It's all right, sir. I know you must be tired. I'm sorry, Evans. They didn't have any donuts. Are you finished with right. these, sir? Yeah. Baker, will you take these to the library? Yeah. Techniques used by North Koreans to indoctrinate United States personnel. Psychology of brainwashing right, methods. Baker. I didn't say Just anything. Take him back, then go down to carpool and get a car. Oh, are we going somewhere? Yep, we're going somewhere. <sighs>
Mrs. Cargill? Yes? I'm Colonel Edwards, investigating My office. husband's on his way to your office. Yes, I know. That's why I'm here. I'd like to talk to you. May I come in? younger than I expected. I'm 32. You don't look it. I look it. Well, Mrs. Cargill, I, uh, I know how painful all this must be for you, but unfortunately it's necessary. I'm here because I'm trying very hard to be fair to your husband, to give him every chance. But I can't do it alone. I need help. How do you expect me to help? Believe me, I'm not your enemy, or your husband's. But you must know he's facing serious charges, and he refuses to defend himself. He refuses to defend himself? Didn't you know? No. You really didn't know, did you? No. Well, can you think of any reason why he won't defend himself? Have you come here to ask me to appear as a witness? Yes, I have, because I think there's more to this case than we can see. Now, if you're afraid you might betray him or might hurt his chances in any way, just let me say that things couldn't be any worse for him than they are right now. What are you going to do to him? On the strength of what we've learned, I'm afraid he'll get the limit. So you see, Mrs. Cargill, you can only help him by telling everything you know. I don't know anything. Well, uh, what has he said about his life in the prison camp? He hasn't said a thing. In all the months he's been back, he's said nothing. Maybe there are some things a man doesn't want to talk about, or can't talk about. Even to his own wife? Especially to his own wife. Well, didn't you ask? Weren't you curious? He was gone two years, eight months, and 17 days. Yes, I was curious. Oh, I thought it would come in time. That if he wanted to tell me, he would. But he never has. What does he talk about? Oh, what do people talk about when they don't want to talk? little things, meaningless things, nothing worth remembering. Well, since he's been back, hasn't he, uh, hasn't he revealed something accidentally? No. You know, a slip of some kind, a story he started to tell, didn't finish, anything like that? No. He's told you absolutely nothing? Well, I remember something that he said on his first day back. He said, why is it that most people can only belong to a family, a country, a religion? Why can't they all belong to just one thing, the human race? Mrs. Cargill, a man who felt that way might be ripe for a cause. And if it were the wrong cause, I'm so afraid... So you that... really think he went over to them? No, 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 I, I didn't say that. But you think it's possible? Isn't it? Is that what they've done? Have they twisted our thinking so that a man has to be a, afraid of a decent instinct? So that he be, has to be ashamed a to show some concern for his fellow man? I'm sorry, Mrs. Cargo, but it's an old trick to hide an ugly reality behind a beautiful phrase. He's been through so much. Why don't you let him go? The fact that he's been through so much is no defense. For his own sake, we've got to make him talk. Can't you understand how he feels? He's a very sensitive man, and he's been deeply hurt. Nobody wants him. His own men have turned against him. He's nobody. He has no place to stand. Oh, Colonel, please give him a place. Give him a place. I can't do a thing, Mrs. Cargill, until I know his story. He's got to talk. And you want me to make him talk, is that all? 
Yes. Colonel. Colonel, he's been home five months. Five months. And in all that time, we haven't even been to bed together. <laughs> you want me to make him talk? <laughs> particular thing of which your husband was afraid. afraid no. Yes, did he have any experiences during the war or, or even before that might have given him a strong fear, an anxiety of some kind? Fear? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't think so. No, the only time I remember him even mentioning the word was well, once in a letter, and I don't suppose that's what you mean. No, 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 no. Go on, you tell me. Well, he, he just said, I have finally become afraid. Yes. I remember it because he'd never written anything like that before. Why was he afraid? Did he say why? No, I don't think so. It's been such a long time, nine years. Please, whatever you can remember might be of some help. I remember how he ended the letter. It was a quotation of some sort. Mm -hmm. He said, who kills one man kills the whole world. And then he added, how many worlds have I killed? Kills one man kills the whole world. How many worlds have I killed? Does that help you in some way? I, uh, I don't know, Mrs. Cargill. I'm not sure, but it might. Well, thank you very much for talking to me. I'm sorry I had to bother you. Thank you. Goodbye. Colonel. Yes? If you, if you do find out anything, I, I mean, if he tells you anything, you will let me know, won't you? Yes, of course I will. Thank you. I'll be waiting. Goodbye, Mrs. Carter. He's two different men. Sir? The man we saw here yesterday and the man his wife described. Two different men. His wife? Yeah, we're just talking to her. And I'm glad I did, too, because that man out there and her cargill, 
Well, Herr Cargill just doesn't commit treason. Well, maybe Herr Cargill changed, sir. Of course he changed, but how? Well, Why? Well, perhaps there was a causative factor that influenced Causative his factor? Evans, where'd you ever dig up a dusty phrase like that? Well, my father was a lawyer. Really? It's not so unusual, sir. There are about 200,000 lawyers in this country, so it shouldn't surprise you so. Everything about you surprises me, Evans. Sir, we were talking about a causative factor. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were. What I was going to say is that something happened to change Cargill. Something big. And obviously rather sudden, because when we... Hey, wait a minute. Yes, sir? Miller's testimony yesterday. Yes, there was something in there when he was describing how Cargill went over. Uh, didn't he say something like, uh, uh, somebody... Somebody means business now, wasn't well, that in there? He said it, I can find it. Good. You got it? Here it is, sir. I can't read this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, don't be such heroes, this man means business now. That's it. That's it, that's it. This man means business now. And this man has got to be Colonel Kim. Colonel Kim means business now. And it happened suddenly. They all said suddenly, didn't they? Well, I think so, sir. I'll check. But the important word is now. Not a month ago or a week ago, but now. That's the word. You got it? The thing happened very suddenly. It took us all by surprise. Happened suddenly. It took us all by surprise. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly. S suddenly. Sir. What? Well, I don't want to interfere with your train of thought. No, don't worry but... about that. Go ahead. What do you got? Well, sir, speaking of repetitive wordage... What do you mean, repetitive wordage? Well, sir, it's true. They all said it happened very suddenly, but there's something else, too. What? Well, when when you were talking about, when the men were describing the, uh, uh, the deaths of Harvey and Connors, they all used very similar phrases in describing the disease and its consequences, like... Bacillary dysentery and dehydration. Well, that's you only know, natural. They didn't have any doctors. They had to be familiar with all kinds of repetitive wordage. Did you make a note of those places? Yes, sir, I did. Captain Mike Stewart's testimony, sir. All right. Question: How did Lieutenant Harvey die? Answer: He died following an acute case of dysentery. Ciliary dysentery, dehydration. You got another one, Evans? Lieutenant Paleskis. Died following an acute case of dysentery. Ciliary dysentery. What's this? And here, sir, Lieutenant Harper's. Died following an acute case of dysentery. It's an acute case. It's never a bad case or a violent case. It's always an acute case, yes, isn't sir, it? Yes, I know. I think you're right, Evans. There are too many witnesses using exactly the same words. Well, I thought it was significant, sir. You see, when you type the same phrase over and over, it begins to make an impression. Corporal, any time you want to interfere with my uh, train of thought, I, I, I mean, if you notice anything that strikes you as being peculiar, you, so your father was a lawyer, huh? Yes, sir. I hope I'm not interrupting anything, Bill, but I want to talk to you. Yes, of course, sir. Didn't you tell me that Lieutenant Miller was your last witness on the Cargill case? That's right, sir. Then why did you go to see Cargill's wife? There's not much around this post that escaped Sergeant Fleischacker. You should know that. Well, Cargill refuses to defend himself. I, I thought his wife might be helpful. So now you're concerned with his defense? Well, sir, if I'm to do my job fairly, I've Are got to... Are you suggesting that I'm asking you not to do your job fairly? No, sir. Bill... We've worked together for years. You know me as well as anyone does. I, I try to be fair-minded. You are. I've let you take your time, even when I thought you were taking more time than was necessary. But Mrs. Cargill is hardly a competent witness to something that happened in the Korean prison camp 9,000 miles away. Bill, I, I don't want to do this. But now I feel compelled to ask you officially for the first time, what's going on in this case? I just can't make any recommendations, sir, until I have all the facts. Then get them, fast. Finish your investigation, let's have the court-martial. General, we can't investigate fairly if we start out by saying there's going to be a court-martial. That's prejudging the evidence. 
You mean there's even a possibility you will not recommend a court-martial? Well, all I'm saying, sir, is that it, it, it's too early to tell. When there is clear evidence of collaboration, photostats of his signature on confessions, recordings of his own voice making broadcasts for them... There are unexplained things, too, sir. Insufficient motive, for one. Insufficient motive? Yes, sir. Maybe the motive was so obvious it hasn't occurred to you. Maybe it was planned this way. Sir? I think Cargill may have been one of them before he ever got to Camp Gigi. Well, there's, there's nothing in the records to indicate that, sir. And I see nothing to indicate otherwise. They could make a big thing out of an American officer, a major, a mature, responsible man going over to them. Bill, uh, this would be a lot easier on both of us. Certainly on me, if this case had been assigned to another post. But the Pentagon assigned it here, and here it is. We, we can't change that. I know, I... I understand that, sir. All right. Then let's get it finished up with efficiency and dispatch. Well, after all, Bill, there's a human side to this, too. Those men. After the hell they went through in that prison camp, now we keep it hanging over them. The knowledge that they'll have to relive it all by testifying. That's quite an ordeal. Believe me, if you could have seen that Lieutenant Miller yesterday at the officers' club, you'd know what I mean. Well, he almost broke down and... almost broke down and cried when he talked about my boy. He told me that one of the men in the camp had died at the funeral when they... when they were covering up the body, Joe stood there at the graveside and said, my brother dies that I may live. May I be worthy of his sacrifice. Yes, that's, uh, that's a very fine sentiment, sir. Well, I, I don't mean to talk about my son. The only point I was making is we can't keep these innocent men sweating it out. It isn't fair to them. So let's get this over with fast and let them pick up their lives again. That's all I'm asking. I'll try, sir. Good. I knew you would. But I still have to be thorough. Thorough? I think you better get Cargill's file and come to my office immediately. Sir, Get Cargill in here before here. Miller shows up. I don't want those two meeting yet. Sir, what about the Look, general? Baker, He's got just to... this once. Let me handle it, will you? Okay, sir. What's going on here? Huh? General is burning his tail, huh? Hello, reception, Scotty. Scotty, you got a major Cargill down there? Yeah. Send him up, will you? Right. What's happening? Okay. All right. Don't tell me. You know, I don't have to be a genius to figure this one out. He's bucking a general. He's sticking his neck out for a traitor. Won't even defend himself. Won't even tell him the truth, right? Right. I tell you, I've been in this man's army a long time. And what? Well, excuse me, sir. See, sir, the uh, colonel asked if you wouldn't like to wait in his office, sir. Baker. Hey, stay out of this.
Major. Sit down, sir. Make yourself comfortable. Like a cigarette, sir? Baker, would you file these for me, please? Oh, come on. Outside later, huh? Let... All right. All right. Have it your way. Sir, we have what is commonly known as a situation around here. Matter of fact, the uh, colonel's down in the general's office right this minute. And he's in the act of what's described in military language as getting... He's being chewed out, as they say, sir. Severely chewed out. Now, this doesn't seem to bother you at all, does it? Baker, please. Now, half the army knows the general's blowing his top. Why shouldn't he? I beg your pardon, sir. Sure you don't want a cigarette? No, thank you. Kink size? No, Filter no, top? no, thank you. Well, you can't catch anything from these things, Major. It's got 100% purified cellulose. It's got activated charcoal, radioactive M3. I mean, you positively couldn't catch a thing from these. After all, sir, I wouldn't want to see you get cancer of the lungs. It's very kind of you to be so solicitous. Oh, sir, this is, uh, this is the most solicitous branch in the Army. You know what we do around here, sir? We worry, don't we? Even about traitors. Take the Colonel, for example. He worries about you. He's knocking himself out on your case, and I mean out. So you know what I was thinking, sir? Well, you're obviously a very deep thinker, Sergeant. I wouldn't even try to guess. I was thinking, sir, that you could show your appreciation for what the Colonel's doing for you by talking. You know, just start to tell him the truth. Of course, if you don't feel like doing that, sir, I got another suggestion for you. What would you suggest? Well, I'm very glad you asked me, because I'll tell you. I'll tell you why I wouldn't want you to get cancer of the lung, sir. It just takes too long. Baker! Leave him alone, Corporal. Thank you, sir. Now, if you'd like my suggestion, get a heart attack. Get run over. Get lost. Get something. That's what you can do, sir. Baker, that's insubordination. Oh, is it? You know what happens to colonels who buck generals? You let the general give him one bad efficiency rate, and he's stuck at colonel for the rest of his time. Well, if that's the worst thing that can happen. Oh, but it isn't. Comes a time when he's forced to retire. So? Well, now, that might be all right with you, but it wouldn't be all right with him. I'm going to explain something to you, Miss Fibetta Kappa. When one is retired by the Army, one does not put an ad in the New York Times saying, U.S. Army man with top experience wants a job in another Army. There's only one Army in this country. It's a monopoly. It might be illegal, but it's true. So for an ex-Army man, there's no other place to go. Now, the Army needs guys like the Colonel because he's fair, he listens, and he'll give a guy a break. So for the Army's sake, I wouldn't want to see him get fouled up, and especially not because of anybody like you. You got it, sir? You know, he's right about one thing. If you talked, you'd make it easier for the colonel. Look, all he's asking you to do is tell the truth so he can make a fair recommendation. Truth? Well, it can only help you. Why has everybody put such store on the truth? Why is truth considered to be so bright and shining and wonderful? Truth can be rotten and destructive and more vicious than any lie. Because a lie might die one day, but the truth never dies. So don't urge the truth on me. I've seen it. The filth, the torture, the misery. What one man can do to another. There's your truth. But if it could save you, or if it could help you in some you, way... You take a piece of granite and put it under pressure until the heat that's created will turn that stone to liquid. Did you know that? Granite. They call that a scientific phenomenon. Well, there's another phenomenon that has to do with something much less durable than granite. It has to do with the mind of man. Now, you put that under enough pressure and it turns to water. When that happens, they don't call that a scientific phenomenon. They just say he's a coward, no good, rotten. They never understand. Well, the Colonel wants to understand. He wants to know what kind of pressure was put on you. Look, you can talk to him. Why won't you defend yourself? Why don't you care anymore? It isn't any one thing that makes a man not care anymore. It isn't that simple. Well, nobody's asking for any simple answers. But there aren't any answers. Just let it go at that.
Sit down, Cargill. If I remember correctly, you smoke, don't you, Major? No, thank you. I want to apologize for yesterday. I mean, about running that tape recording so long. I didn't realize you were so sensitive about it. I only hope you've recovered sufficiently so that today you can answer some questions. I don't know any more today than I did yesterday. And perhaps today you'll tell me a little more of what you do know. Look, I told you yesterday I'm guilty. Now, I don't see any point in going over the same ground again. Oh, we're not going over the same ground, Major. I'd like to touch on some things that we didn't even mention yesterday. Like a certain sequence of events which becomes very striking. Sequence of a events? A definite pattern of life in that prison camp. Brainwashing, starvation, sickness, death. For nine months, yet no man broke. And there was a period of three months when nobody died. And then suddenly, very suddenly, as a matter of fact, in a 48-hour period, Lieutenant Harvey died, Captain Connors died, and you broke. That's right. Was there any connection between the deaths of Harvey and Connors and your breaking? None. Your breaking followed their deaths so closely, I think there must be a connection. I'm telling you, there wasn't. All right. I accept it. Incidentally, how did Harvey die? I don't remember. You don't remember? Man can't remember everything. No. Of course not. Major, at whose burial did you say, my brother dies that I may live? May I be worthy of his sacrifice? <laughs> they told you that, did they? There can't be any harm in admitting you said it, can there? I said it. Why? If you were to give some reason as to why you broke, what would that reason be? I suppose that some men are weaker than others. You mean then that you were the weakest man in your shack? Evidently. You signed confessions, you made broadcasts, you gave lectures, all because you were weak. A man wants to stay alive. And in your desire to stay alive, you didn't think of the effect of what you did. Effect? It didn't trouble you that probably 200 million Asiatics were hanging in the balance. That your words were weapons against everything you ever believed in. That didn't matter. No, it didn't matter. It didn't matter that you might be endangering the lives of millions of your own countrymen. Because that's what it'll cost if Asia falls to the enemy. That didn't matter. I told you before how many times I have to tell you it didn't matter. Well, tell me again, Major Harry Cargill, specialist on germ warfare. Shut up! What's the matter, Major? Don't you like the sound of it? Do you know what I think? I think you were frightened by that recording yesterday because it haunts you. I think you're haunted by the ghosts of dead minds as well as dead bodies. Minds that you helped to kill by your broadcasts. Minds that were pushed over the brink by you. Isn't that right, Major? I told you to shut up. Answer me, isn't that right? I don't have to answer, answer you. Answer me! What kind of an inquisition is this? You'd like it to be an inquisition, wouldn't you? But it's not going to be. You're going to be defended whether you like it or not. Because we've got a standard of justice we'll follow in spite of you. Standard of justice? You poor fool, that's ancient history, Colonel. You're out of style, you and your standards. You're obsolete. It's a new kind of world. Kill, destroy, dog eat dog. And maybe that's the way it ought to be because I don't think mankind deserves any better. You really believe that? Yes, I believe that. Who kills one man kills the whole world. How many worlds have I killed? Where did you hear that? Your wife. My wife? You leave her out I'll of I'll get my think. information any way I can, Cardinal. Now get in. You had no right. I don't care what you do to I me. I said get in. Right. That's an order. <laughs> Yes, sir. All right, get him in. Sir, here, here are the carbons of Miller's testimony. Okay, thanks. Get Baker, too. Yes, sir. much we have to cover today. I was just going over your testimony last night. I'd like to clear up a few minor points. Well, I'll do anything I can to help, sir. That's fine. I knew you would. Now, first, when Cargill said, this man means business now, 
What was he referring to? Cargo said that? That's what you told me yesterday. No, sir. I don't think I oh, said yes. that. Oh, yes. Yes, you did, Lieutenant. You said, uh... You said Cargo said, Don't be such heroes. This man means business now. Well, if it's in there, I guess I must have said it. I'm sorry, sir. I forgot, I guess. What do you mean by that? Well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Is it? Well, yes. Well, the way I figured, Colonel Kim must have been getting impatient, you know. Well, all that time had gone by, nobody had cracked or anything, so he's getting ready for a showdown. And was he? Well, I don't know, sir. It was Cargill that said it, not me. Yes. Now, speaking of things Cargill said, my brother dies that I may live. May I be worthy of his sacrifice. Did Cargill say that? Yes, sir. Or did Captain Connors say that? No, sir. Cargill but said it. But you told it. the general his son said it. Well, sir, with all, all due respect to the general, he, he must have misunderstood me because it was Cargill that said it. I see. Now, another thing, Miller. In the 48 hours before Cargill broke, two men died, Lieutenant Harvey and Captain Connors. That's right, sir. I told you about that yesterday, sir. Yes, I know you did. Now, I wonder if you'd mind telling me how Harvey died. I told you that, too, yesterday. And you can tell me again, can't you? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Lieutenant Harvey died following an acute case of dysentery. And Connors? Same thing. An acute case of dysentery. Yes, sir. You're sure of Yes, sir. I'm sure I was there. Come in. By the door, Peggy. All right, Major, come in. to tell me how Lieutenant Harvey and Captain Connors died. I told you. I want to hear it again. Not everyone seems to have the same memory of it. They died of dysentery. You see, sir, in cases of bacillary dysentery, the incidence of death is pretty high, especially when there's no medicine. You see, what happens is Dehydration sets in. Dehydration sets in. And the sick man suffers. He suffers from a general wasting away. Go ahead, Lieutenant. Well, um, you see, sir, there wasn't much anything we could do. See, this, uh, we, uh, we didn't have any choice. Well, we had to, we had to pool our rice, and we had to pool our water, and we, and we tried to keep the sick ones alive. We, you told him, then you, then you. You told him everything. I didn't tell him anything. Yes, you yes, he did tell me. He told me he doesn't remember Harvey and Connors dying of dysentery. He doesn't remember that at all. So come on, Miller, the truth. Come on, let's have it. Talk. Don't. Come on, the truth. No lies, no memorized speeches, just the truth. Spill it. Don't say anything. I told him nothing. It wasn't only me. You got to believe that. All right, it wasn't only you. Now, come on, everything, the rest of it. Everything. We were all in it together, all of us. I swear, that's the truth. We all voted for it. We had to do it. Everybody agreed to do it. Everybody except him. You can't do it. Now, this is it. Can't draw lots for a man's life. Why not? He's guilty. Now, you had your say, and you got outvoted. Now, shut up. Whoever gets this one, he's the man. 
this together. And nobody talks. Ever. That includes you, Cargill. Understand? You better understand. Couple of days. Really put me through the ringer. Come, let's get off work. Hey, what's wrong? Anybody? No, nobody. Well, take another look. Take a good look. Yeah, while you're looking around, Connors, take a look in that corner. think he is, Connors. He's dead. This night I told him not to try to escape. It was suicide. It was just one chance on a thousand. You're wrong, Connors. He didn't have any chance. What do you mean? You know what we mean. Hey, hey let me go, you guys! Come on, let go! Shut up! Leave me alone! You're gonna shut up! Are you? How do they know that Harvey planned to make a break for it? No. I never mentioned his name. What did you mention? No. Then how did they know? I don't know. Well, someone tipped him off. And you're the only guy who's been out of this shack since yesterday morning. The only one, Carlos. Listen, that doesn't prove a thing. There are ten guys tried breaking out of here. Not one of them made it. Harvey didn't have a chance. You guys know that. There's something you ought to know. Harvey never tried to escape. What? He wasn't going to make a break for it. We talked him out of it. He'd be alive now, except for you. No, 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 no. Shut up. 
You told them, Connors, because when they came here, they know exactly what to look for. They were looking for a guy with a knife on him. They found a knife on Harvey, and they shot him in the back because you tipped him off. Oh, listen. Kim promised he wouldn't do it. He promised he wouldn't kill him. He told him. Connors! No! 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 No, Miller. Mm. Holy. Miller, no! No, Miller! No, no! No, no, Miller! Miller, no! No! Sorry I had to do this to you, Miller. I don't care. I'm glad I told her. It's no rotten secret anymore. Well, will they try me for murder? No, I, I don't think so. You sure? Evans, the notes. Miller, I, I want you to see this. There'll be no record in the file. You just forget it. The evidence is inadmissible. Thank you. Come on, Lieutenant. Lieutenant, come on, sir. George, I'm sorry. Don't you touch me. Lieutenant, Lieutenant, come on, sir. Come on, sir. Come on, Lieutenant. Come on, sir. Come on, please, sir. Come on. All right, Cargill, that's part of the story. Now, what's the rest of it? It wouldn't help. It might help you. You just take my word for it, it wouldn't. What happened after Connors was killed? There were no more stool pigeons. Oh, don't stall. The other men were there. They know what happened. They'll talk. Will they? Oh, no, Colonel. Whatever Miller did, they're accessories to it. Now, what are you going to do? Force it out of them, too, and then apologize? Just talk fast. There's no time anymore. I just don't care. Well, you're going to have to care. What happened after Connors was killed? You're wasting your time. Talk! Edwards. It wouldn't do any good. Please, Colonel Edwards! Let me in there, please! Colonel Edwards! I'm going to get them into trouble. Believe me, they're good men, decent men. When the pressure got too much for them, they started killing each other. Well, I can't condemn them for that. I'm not condemning or condoning. I'm only trying to help you. All right, then tell me this. What's going to happen when they start putting pressure on the whole human race? Did I see the beginning of the end, and am I the only one who knows it? Well, look, the only thing that counts now is the truth. When we... All right, take it easy. Take it easy. They're going to try me for murder. I'm not the only one. We were all in it together. Please tell Tell him. No, we're not off. Well, What's yeah. the matter with you? Come Did on, you sir. Did you get the rest of the world? Did you get a lot of to a pigeon? Well, any of you were a traitor, not us. Now they're going to drive me for murder. Shut up, Warren. Right, look, what's what? what do you mean, murder? Murder? murder. Who was murdered? The lousy stool Never pigeon. Never shut up. Let him talk. Pigeon. Look, sir, the man's in no condition to talk about anything. We killed him, that's what about him. He told him some poor guy who was planning to escape. And so we killed him. And your son, your wonderful son. All right. All right. Come on. Come on, Lieutenant. What was he going to say? Sir, the man was hysterical. Anything he was going to say would have meant absolutely nothing. You wouldn't have hit him if you didn't know what he was going to say. It was something about my son planning to escape. What was it? It wouldn't do any good, sir. 
Colonel, I'm ordering you to give me information relative to a case under my jurisdiction. Do you refuse? No, sir. Very well, then. The name of the man who betrayed my son. You see what I mean about the truth? You keep your clever remarks to yourself, Major. Believe me, sir, I was not trying to be clever. That's all for now, Cargo. Your excuse. Just a moment, Major. You feel pretty safe and smug here, don't you, Cargo? Hiding behind due process of law. Please, sir. It galls me to see traitors like you being coddled here. Sir, I beg you to leave this man alone. Suppose you tell me who betrayed my son, Major. I insist you leave him alone. I'm interrogating him, Colonel. All right, Major, who was it? Who betrayed my son? I... I can't answer that, sir. Can't you? Honor among traitors, is that it? One dirty swine protecting another? One lousy collaborator? Damn it, sir, stop it! I, I, I'm sorry, sir, but I, I just couldn't let you go on that way, not without knowing the truth. Your son wasn't betrayed. He wasn't killed by the enemy. He was killed by his own men. He was the stool pigeon. It's a lie. No, sir, it's the truth. It's a lie you made up to protect this man. It's the truth, sir. You have no proof. I have conclusive proof. My son, he was raised to know better, to be better. I can't forgive cowardice, especially in my own son. Why? That's right. Why? Why are we always so much quicker to blame those we love rather than those we hate? Is it because weakness in them is somehow weakness in ourselves? Is that it? I didn't love your son, General, but I didn't hate him either, so maybe I'll be allowed to speak a few words on his behalf. A man can be a hero all his life, but if in the last month of it, or the last week, or even the last minute, the pressure becomes too great and he breaks, then he's branded for life. You can't ask a man to be a hero forever. There ought to be a time limit. There is no defense for treason. I wouldn't use words like treason if I were you, and I would never set myself up to judge anybody. Just don't be a hero on somebody else's time, General. And don't ever hate a man for what he does under pressure. Your son was a hero. I give you my word. Hundreds of days he was a hero. And only one day did he break. But in the name of God, aren't all those other days worth something? Does he lose his standing in the human race because he broke on that one last day? They didn't understand, so they killed him. But at least they thought they had a reason to save their lives. But what reason have you got, General? A set of rules, a code? Well, it's not enough. Because you don't have a code that fits a man to face them. Your code doesn't have all the answers, not all the answers. All right, Major, you've said enough. No, sir, I've not said enough. Your son was a human being and somebody's going to speak for him. My son is dead. And there's a dignity in that no matter how he died. But you, Major, are alive. 
And I'll be damned if I'll stand here and allow you to attack a code that better men than you have lived and died by. The code? The co How much does the code ask of a man? Everything. If the man's a soldier, his life. His life? You think that's the most that a man can lose? What are you talking about? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. You're in a prison camp, nobody breaks. Months and months of cold and torture and starvation and nobody breaks. And then one day a man does break and his own men kill him for it. And the commander of the camp is furious because he's been robbed of the one victory he's been able to achieve. So he calls in the ranking officer and he says to him, I have reached the limit of my patience. Either you cooperate or I kill all 16 men. What would you do, General? I want an answer. What would you do? Stand fast? Let them all be killed? That is a chance you have to take. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe that's the answer. For heroes. But I was no hero. I couldn't take that chance. To me, those 16 men, the wives, the families, they seemed important. They still seem important. How many lies for a man's life? Hmm? I don't know. I just gave them everything they wanted. Everything. I had a feeling, sir. On his record, he wasn't the kind of man who'd do something like this for a selfish reason. He couldn't defend himself without incriminating 16 other men. I'm sorry about this man and everything that's happened to him. And it's precisely because I'm sorry that I know why we need the code. I want your recommendation at once. General, this is an extremely harsh application of the rule. Is it? This man's had it. No man's exempt. Not this man, not my son, no one. Because after you've said everything that could be said, the fact would remain. He did help the enemy. Sir, I think it's only fair to tell you if he's brought to trial, I'd like to defend him. That's your privilege, Bill. Major Cargill. You asked me a question. You at least deserve an answer. The choice that you had to make in that prison camp was no different than the choice that confronts every military leader. The decision involving the life or death of his men. You were a sensitive man. A humane man. I sympathize with that man, but you are also a soldier. And as a soldier, you have failed, just as my son failed. You talk to me of 16 men. Multiply that by thousands. Try carrying that weight on your shoulders. Try sleeping with the cries of those wives and children in your ears. I've done that, Major. Every wartime commander has done it. Because until a better world is built, it's got to be done. That is why we have the code, Major. The code is our Bible, and thank God for it. I'll be waiting for your recommendation, Bill. Under the circumstances, I will, of course, disqualify myself. Right. I was wrong and I should be tried. Reasons don't matter. Reasons do matter. When a man's mind is attacked, how does he protect himself? How does he fight back? You didn't tell the other men why you went over, did you? 
part of your deal with Colonel Kim? Evans, take this, will you? Concerning the charges in the case of Major Harry Cargill, recommendation is as follows. Considerable evidence has been amassed to prove that Major Cargill willingly collaborated with the enemy. There is now also evidence to indicate that he did so unselfishly and to preserve the lives of his fellow prisoners. Although he was mistaken in his judgment, he was surely no traitor. Therefore, I personally recommend that all charges be dropped and no court-martial be conveyed. Now, uh, don't let that recommendation fool you. There'll be a court-martial. Oh, I expect that. It's, it's just good to know that somebody understands. Well, we've got a long way to go. Can you be here tomorrow morning? Yes, sir, I'll be here. We free at 8, Evans? Yes, sir, we're free. Eight o'clock, then. And, Major? Give my regards to your wife. Yes, sir. Colonel. Do you think we can get the answers this way? Well, I can promise you one thing, Major. They'll know we ask the questions. Yeah.